trekked in the hills of northwest Arkansas, I know this place that gets you back to nature lets you slow down and get back to your thoughts. For me, it even gets me back to my roots. I'm Beth Turner. I grew up in Ozark, Arkansas, hungry to get out and see the world and find adventure. But when I began researching family history, I found the adventures of the world hiding in the hills just 16 miles outside Ozark city limits. It's a spot on the map people haven't yet overdeveloped, polluted, or tamed. It used to be the best connection between Northwest Arkansas and Interstate 40, the treacherous, tricky, inconspicuous Highway 23, known as the Pig Trail. The Pig Trail was truly the Pig Trail, the trail for the people that were uh, going to the University of Arkansas and back. Right where the Mulberry River Bridge and the Mulberry River intersect is where you'll find a country store called Turner Bend. Founded in 1911 by my great grandpa, owned by my grandpa, and boyhood home of my father. This store has seen its share of changes, but one thing stays the same. Once you stop in here, you'll feel like part of the family. I remember loving to drive up there at night. They always had the outside light burning, and it just was so inviting. So here we go on a journey through my family's past. Stories of outlaws and treasures of gold, where my ties to this land may bend but never break. Here in the heart of the valley. No city lights up here. Where the river runs wild. For me, the story starts here. I knew Turner legends and family stories by the folklore my dad spun while mowing their graves. But to understand how these hills are now synonymous with the Turner name, we have to go back further than the local headstones. I am thinking today of my old home. But the Turner family was pretty big, and even at that time, uh, Joseph Thrasher had several brothers and sisters, and, and uh, in, in essence, every one of them eventually came over here and settled in this area. Uh, you're sitting right now at Joseph Thrasher's brother's place, which was Elias T. Turner. That was your triple great-grandfather, and he, he built this house here, and it, it's still standing today. Great, great, great grandparents Elias T. and Sarah Durning Turner came here with $2,000 for 1,500 acres. Now this is still around the 1840s. There's not a bank out here today and there wasn't one then either. And Elias told the wrong man where he kept his money. It was Elias T. that uh, the traveling preacher took his land buying money. <laughs> Elias honored that debt and still prospered into one of the largest landowners of the valley. He was a leader. He served as Justice of the Peace. But wanting to do more, in 1879, he tried to serve as a state legislator. I don't think he was much of a legislator. He served, but he was so mad about the way things was going that uh, he probably didn't get a whole lot done. I read some of his letters, you know, that he wrote back to his wife. Uh, he was really upset because he thought there was something needed to be done at all times. Too many of it went to hot springs to the horse races. After raising nine children on this bend, Elias passed away in 1885. He was 63 years old. Eight years later, Sarah followed at age 73. They were both pillars in this community. And now when I'm in this cemetery, I know why that headstone stands so tall. Out of Elias and Sarah's nine children, their second is my great-great-grandfather. Samuel Gilbert Turner. Like father like son, he also became the Valley's Justice of the Peace and a major landowner, purchasing his first 200 acre homestead on top of the hill, as we say. And when it came to falling in love, Samuel stayed within the branches of our family tree, marrying his Aunt Susan's daughter. 
Samuel and Phoebe, the great-grandparents, they were first cousins. <laughs> That's why we got so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> they were first cousins. They're, um, and they were Samuels, what? They were what to us? Our great-grandparents. She was a little woman, smoked a pipe, feisty as hell, real feisty. And she didn't take much off anybody. Sam was a great big man. He stood over six foot tall, broad-shouldered, but he wouldn't mess with Phoebe because she put him in his place in a hurry. During the Civil War, Phoebe rallied her neighbors to help bury Confederate soldiers slaughtered during the guerrilla warfare that dominated these hills. One version of the story that I have heard is that there was a, a group of Confederate soldiers encamped here and they were ambushed or, or bushwhacked by Union soldiers and killed in place. At night or sometime after that, the local people um, came and, and buried them in the spot where they had, where had been killed or had been camped. And so this, this cemetery um, has been called Soldier's Field or Soldier's Cemetery for a number of years. We can't lay out the specifics of where we are to protect the dead. These days, grave robbers desecrate sacred ground for bits of bullets or buttons. Back at their homestead on top of the hill, Sam and Phoebe raised a family of 10 children. They taught them to welcome guests off the dusty trail, but sometimes weary travelers welcome themselves. That, 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 that's the place they were living whenever uh, Jesse James come by and spent the night with them. Supposedly Jesse James visited the Turner Bend and some people believe it and some people don't. And I don't really know, but I get a kick out of hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> After Sam tamed the top of the hill, he decided to resettle closer to his crops. Around 1885, he loaded up the family and caravan to the valley. Now you can see that cellar? Yeah. Okay. That was right in behind your, your double great-grandpa's house, Sam's house. And that house, uh, see it's on kind of an incline? Mm -hmm. There was a great big porch went around it. It wouldn't be big today if you've seen it, but it was then. And, uh, we'd come up here and we'd play cars on that porch. And it was, the dirt would be dry and it would be nice. Nice place to play, enjoy it. But all of this valley in here belonged to your, uh, on this side of the river, belonged to your, uh, your great-grandfather, Sam. Great-great-grandfather. That move to the valley allowed Sam closer access to his crops and allowed his second son to move into his hand-carved home on the hill. Meet my great-grandpa, William Eli. Now, Eli is known for making more Turner history than anyone in the family. Eli had 24 children. 12 by his first wife, Jelana Markham. After she passed away, he had 12 by his second wife, Nora Martin. And like father, like son, Eli raised family on the hill and crops in the valley. And to protect those crops, Eli became known as the only man to tame the tide of the Mulberry River. He owned the farm just that was right in harm's way if, if the Mulberry jumped its banks in a flood, which it was prone to do. Well, he, he built this massive 400 foot long uh, rock wall that was like 11 feet tall and 10 feet wide at the base and six feet at the top, big enough that a wagon could drive down the top of it. Like the Turners themselves, that wall stood from 1898 until 1982. Yep, Turners influenced this landscape for decades. But as embedded in these hills as the Turners became, the hard times got harder and our grasp began to slip away. See, a lot of these lands in this part of Arkansas were abandoned uh, back, in, back in the early 1900s 
because people couldn't make enough money off these lands from farming practices to pay for taxes and to pay for seed. So it was that around 1911, Eli decided to diversify his interests and build a country store along his bend. Grandpa and Uncle Gilbert built the store where your, where your grandpa ran it, which, which, which really become known in my time as Turner Bend. Let me introduce you to Champ Clark Turner, Jelina's youngest and my grandpa. Now around the time Champ took over Turner Bend, we're in the 1930s. The one lane dirt bridge has just been replaced with a two lane paved number. And that's where Champ stole his first kiss from Flora Jane Coleman, a grandmother. Eventually, three sons were added to the family, Gary, Lonnie, and Paul. See the one looking like a politician? That's Dad. Grandpa and Grandma lived a simple life along this road, raising their boys while running the store and living in the back, or rather living out front, it was so hot indoors. Running a mechanic shop and gas station, a small farm and cabin rentals, Grandma and Grandpa worked hard, but they were a happy bunch and always welcomed company. That was the home base and people came in from all over the country to stay there and she'd put them in the cabins and the beds and she'd find a place for them. They've always welcomed us and made us feel right at home. Her and Uncle Jim, both of them. Always made us feel like we were family yeah. and always, you know, we were just one, one of the family and, you know, I was here doing some laundry and she says, you have to iron those things. So, you know, that was right in with the family mode. And her but. and I used to help Aunt Flo with the laundry and I remember it was so hot and we'd lug those clothes across the highway and hang them down. As soon as you walked in, you knew you were welcome. That is good. I remember her not being that good of a cook. I, well, she always gave us food, I didn't say it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she always made sure we had something to eat that was not nice, Beth. <laughs> Champ and Flo were never rich. They didn't own the acreage of Grandpa's fathers before him. Yet this valley's heartbeat seemed to originate right here in this bend. People would stop by after hours and need gasoline or produce or something, and they'd go in and get it. They never hesitated. They never said, oh, we're closed. Your whole life lived right in the public eye because you're, you know, whatever you my little bit of time spent there, if you were cooking supper, the smell drifted right into the store and hey what are you eating for supper there you know and people wanting to stick their head around the corner me had no privacy at all people had car trouble champ would jump in the car and go with them up the road Street. people even came by with uh, injuries brought their children by for champ to put a band-aid on it or wash it out it was just the oddest thing <laughs> you know? you say that man that raised up down there is your daddy? Yep. Well, I know him from my way back there. I knew his daddy, Champ Turner. Do you know him? Meet Jesse Jones, just one of the Valley's lifelong residents my grandpa served over the years. Now I've known Jesse Jones as the old man who waves at canoers while whittling wood and picking a banjo on his front porch. But meeting him conjures images of family members I'll never meet. Well, you can probably tell by looking at me that I'm a mountain boy. And I like the mountain girls too. He's also the man who owned the land where lost gold is said to be buried. Story has it that in the 1500s, Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto came through here, leaving markings that lead to a treasure of gold he left behind. Uh, when you start around that S curve, you know, there on the right, you've got that big bluff face, um, that there were supposed to have been, um, or there were what, what they called hieroglyphic writings at the time. And I've seen some pictures of it. Um, um, some kind of markings that they attributed to be uh, indicating where DeSoto buried the Spanish gold. Records do show DeSoto dying on the banks of the Mississippi River in southeast Arkansas, 
but by all accounts, he was looking for gold, not burying it, and he probably never made it to these hills. And so for over a hundred years, you know, people have been um, digging in that area and, 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 and in the Mulberry River Valley, still looking for that Spanish gold. Do you still see people dig for the Spanish gold? Well, I've never seen none of it, but uh, there's some of them yet would, would still like to hunt. There's some of it over there in that old cave, you know. The people are just curious. Did not dig for gold, no. Oh, I might have scratched around a little bit in a few places, but I found a ring one time and been run over. Progress meandered into the valley. Dad remembers watching workers roll out the pavement on Highway 23, and he remembers how much money it made him that summer. Best summer I ever had. How'd you make the money? Fixing truck flats. I could fix that truck flat, and I'd get uh, I'd get a dollar for it. And I could fix uh, several of them, but I wasn't no bigger than popcorn far. Uh, but I could sure swing that hammer and fix that flat because that was a lot easier than pulling beans for a penny a pound. The paved road eventually brought tourists to the bend and my grandparents started helping river enthusiasts get up and down the mulberry. But in 1976, their hard work slowed when Grandpa was diagnosed with lung cancer. While he struggled to hold on to the land and to life, crime invaded the Turner Bend store. Now the law quickly caught up with those criminals. And as his last patron can tell you, the cancer caught up with Grandpa. You know, he seemed very frail when we, when we got this shuttle from him. There it was one, one early March day. Grandpa died the fall of 1978. Hundreds attended his service. People poured out of the funeral home like the flowers pouring over his grave. The heart of Turner Bend left with Grandpa, and there wasn't a Turner able to bring it back. Then Brad Wimberly made his annual trek to Arkansas. When he found his favorite spot in disrepair, Brad decided it was time to make his dream of becoming a river outfitter a reality. A lot of people had the phone number and you to call Turner Bend for river information. A unanimous decision was made to sell the store to Brad, who agreed to keep our name out front. Uh, someone asked me one time, do I like him? I said, yeah, I do. He's done everything you'd ever say you'd do, plus he paid his bill either on time or early. And so when people do that, what can you say? Brad has built and rebuilt the store into the one you see today, never closing the doors once during each upgrade. He's enjoyed the tourists, the river rats, and the students bound for college. But in 1999, workers completed construction on Interstate 540, creating an alternate route to and from Northwest Arkansas. The pig trail became the forgotten highway. When they opened up 540, and you know, not only was that uh, a blow to the business, to, you know, we also lost these these customers that we got to know. And with the university up there, a lot of them were pretty educated, and it was, you know, uh, we lost that whole that whole thing just went away, just like that. About the same time we lost all that, we, the uh, motorcycles became more popular. And so we see more motorcyclists now than, than way more than before. And we've kind of become a, a stopping point for motorcyclists. And then they're, you know, they're a real good group of customers. Is this your first time to be in this area? Yes, for very first time. And I tell you what, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It, it is absolutely beautiful. It, it really is. I mean, you, you can't beat these roads anywhere. 
I would be scared to death to be riding on the pig trail. Can you tell, is it, what is it like to drive the pig trail on a bike? That's some excellent riding. Excellent riding. That's some of the funnest riding you'll do is driving around those little windy curve roads. That's a lot of fun. You just pick a nice speed and just cruise through there and enjoy it. Uh, all the bike activity looks wonderful. The, I've never seen so many bikes in that here at Turner Bend today as they're here today. Yeah. They are all excellent looking bikes and all people seem to be very well mannered and have a great time. We don't have the the day-to-day -day steady business that we might have had in the past and then that was really helpful in trying to run a business. Now it's you know we have quiet days and then the busy days are busier than ever. So it's, the store business is is about like the river level. It's you know it's 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 up and it's down and you know it's either it's either great or it's barely flowing. You know, <laughs> or it's or it's flooding. <laughs> In the 1800s, great, great, great uncle Joseph Thrasher Turner ran Turner's Ferry, helping people cross the Mulberry River. But today, the river is a playground. And whether it's high, low, rain or shine, it's still where you'll probably find my sister Dina. She might even have her three daughters in tow. Never a bad day on the river, just some are better than others. This area is also becoming a musical hotspot, thanks to the folks at Mulberry Mountain Lodge, proud hosts of events like Wakarusa and the Mulberry Mountain Harvest Music Festival. Well, now that I'm grown, think us through, and I'd have more and more things to do, but this habit's got me hooked. There ain't no cure, if honky tonk could kill, then I'm a goner for sure. I got a honky tonk habit, and I just can't stop. Father and son, Vernon and Dewey Patton, are part of the family-run operation of Mulberry Mountain Lodge, located next to Fly Gap, aptly named for the flies that gathered around a great uncle's moonshine still at the waterfall. The Pattons noticed that now, this area is facing misuse and disrepair. Today we're doing some trail work on the, uh, the Mountain Creek Waterfalls Trail. It's a, uh, a trail that leads down to two or three different really cool waterfalls down here in the Ozark National Forest. In order to take care of this, we put together, it's called the Pig Trail Forest Preservation Society. And we're generating monies from different events that goes into this nonprofit organization. And we're using uh, that money to hire groups like from the University of Arkansas and anybody that's environmentally interested in the Ozarks and the environment to come down and help repair these trails. We have events and during these events we have wheat straw and corn stalks and so forth and products that you use to control erosion with. So we're taking these and uh, recycling them into the national forest into these huge eroded ravines and the process that we use will slow the water down, collect the sediment and before it gets to Mountain Creek and before it gets to the Mulberry River. Thank goodness for the people who are the valley's new caretakers. My dad and his brothers were the last Turners to be raised on the bend. Turners no longer dominate this area. Oh, we're still here. We're in the campgrounds on the river hiking a waterfall trail. But the Turner Bend alive in my memories, in my father's stories and legends, reflects a time gone by. 
a time that passed away with my grandparents. There was a lot of turners raised up here and uh, that now it, it we just come back for the memories. Uh, when we look in the station, we th we're thinking of something else when we get here. I haven't been out here once that I haven't enjoyed myself. The, everything is just wooden and rock and very natural and the sunlight and the trees and even the highway being, you know, right there has a natural hum to it. Um, it's, it's just a really good feeling out here. Their legacies live on, if you know where to look. Here in the heart of this little Arkansas Valley, where the river still runs wild. You're up again now. If you come with me, I ain't coming down again. If you come with me, I ain't coming down again. If you come with me, I ain't coming down again. If you come with me. Come with me, I ain't coming down.